All right, all right, I'm back. Marathon 132. I've been gone for almost three weeks. I've been immersed in this big job. I've told you all about that. But I was able to come up for air for a weekend, and I wanted to get a good long video out. I hope you guys enjoy it. Got six, maybe seven, maybe five stories. I can't remember how many we're doing in this video, but it's going to be a longer video. Neoma Finn, my good friend, who's been helping me with this channel, is actually becoming kind of a co-host at What If It's True. Has narrated a couple of stories, and one of them is her own experience with Bigfoot. It should be really interesting. The second one she's doing is from my friend Todd, who has sent me several stories. He's a cryptid story collector and researcher. And whenever he has an interesting conversation with someone, he sends me uh, pretty much a transcript and his thoughts about the conversation, and it's always good. And Neoma has been good enough to agree to narrate that one for me because I love Todd's stories. And then old Redneck Cam's going to do three or four, so I hope you guys enjoy this video. I'm going to shut up now. Let's get rolling. All right, here we go. Okay, here's another email from a woman and she does not want her name disclosed. She wants to be anonymous and that is no problem at all. She writes, I live in West Virginia. We have a few bears that make themselves known every now and again, but my dog is my protector. For over a month, he was barking at the entrance to the forest every time I went outside. I just chalked it up to being a bear. I have over two acres of lawn that has to be my responsibility to keep up since my husband passed away. At the end of my garden boxes, there's a stretch of grass next to the hemlock spruce that surrounds the yard and separates it from the forest. I was going about my normal mowing duty around the ends of the garden boxes when a massive black hand reached out and touched my face as if to just feel my face. This hand was extremely calloused and dark, even the palms. There was no way it belonged to a man. I was scared. I was so scared that I pushed the handles on the zero-turn lawnmower as hard as I could, and I did not look back. I jumped off the mower at the front porch, and I ran inside. The mower sat there for three days because I wasn't coming out of that house for any reason. Although I had never been one to believe in Bigfoot, I did a computer search. I had always considered it a fable or a way for people to get attention. But now I know. I reasoned with myself that these things have been there always. Apparently, one just finally got curious to know what a human feels like. If I could just convince myself that they're not going to hurt me, I think I would feel better going back outside, but I'm still not so brave. I like for my house to look neat, and I do a lot of work myself. I was giving my garage a fresh coat of paint when I heard walking in the woods. They were heavy footsteps with breaking twigs and rustling leaves. I was fine until they stopped just to my right in the tree line. I didn't know what to do, so I did what any dummy would do. I started singing. I sang several songs and nothing happened, so I finished the painting and I went back inside. There was another time I was washing my car, and just as I was finishing, I heard the sound of breaking twigs once again. They stopped within 20 feet of me, somewhere in the tree line, this time I heard a sound like a very big man sitting down on something that was way too short. Boom! It was very loud. I could see inside the tree line, but I was too afraid to look closer. I stay inside a lot now. I have a new husband, and when I told him, he laughed at me. I think he thought I was joking. Now, I've never mentioned it again to anyone until now. If they are still there, I will leave them alone as long as they leave me alone. I'll listen to your stories, and it keeps me from thinking that I'm completely insane. 
Well, ma'am, I am so glad that other people sharing their stories makes you feel better about telling yours and making you feel like you're not insane because you're not. I mean, obviously, hundreds and thousands of people have had experiences not quite like this one. This thing reached out and touched your face. And I would just say, and I don't, I don't want to give any bad advice here, but just think about it. If it was close enough just to reach out and brush your face, then it was close enough to reach out and grab you by your shirt and jerk you into the woods. So they're probably not there to hurt you. And I think your intuition is right. Maybe it just wanted to feel the touch of your skin. It wanted to see what a human feels like. And that's understandable. Heck, if I saw a Bigfoot, I'd like to reach out and see what its fur feels like, wouldn't you? I wouldn't be too worried about it. I hope you get back out or hope you are getting back out and enjoying the outdoors. I know I love working outdoors. I'm stuck inside all the time with this work. But man, when I get a chance to go out, I'm, I just love it. And it doesn't matter if I'm cutting grass, whatever. So I know what you, I know what you enjoy about it all. And uh, I hope you're getting out again. I wouldn't worry about it too much. Thank you so much for sending the story. It was wonderful. We really appreciate it. It's been freezing here the last week. For several nights, it's been below 10 degrees in Mississippi. Can you believe that? So inside the house, it's freezing. And I put off going to bed because it's so cold in that bedroom. But finally, the other night, I crawled under the sheets. My wife was already asleep. I think she was about to start snoring. But I woke her up when I got into bed. And we laid there a minute. And she, she, she looked over at me. She goes, you smell great. Did you just take a shower? And I'm like, no, I took one this morning. She said, it's that Yeti soap. She said, I love that soap on you. I'm going to get me some. She wants some of the feminine smells, some of the flowery smells and all. And I'm about to make an order and I'm going to use my 10% discount, my DC 10 discount code. But the soap that I've been using is the hippie number one, and it just has the longest lasting scent. It's like it sticks to your body. And I feel so clean after I get out of the shower. Never, I've never felt that clean. I'm also about to order some of the Yeti Coal. The Yeti Coal is a black bar of soap. They call it a traditional African Yeti Shea soap. It's oak moss and aloe top notes with Yeti floral undertones. And it contains the Yeti activated charcoal. It's a cleansing agent. It's a black soap. And when you rinse off, the black will go down the drain. I've used it before. These are two soaps that uh, one I can't wait to use, the other that I love. I wanted to let you guys know that these guys make an awesome product. You know, they're also making, they call it salve. It's actually body lotion or hand cream. If you look on their website at yetibars.net, you'll see Yeti salve number one. That's the hippie number one scent. They've got the Yeti Bay Rum salve, and they also have a Yeti Hunter salve with a no scent. They also have a Yeti Hunter soap. No scent soap, be good and clean, but you don't have a scent on you. And they have so many other varieties, Yeti Klondike, Yeti Glacier, Yeti Violets, Yeti Yucalo, Yeti Cedar and Coal. We've talked about the Hippie number one. They have a patchouli scent, smoothness scent. It goes on and on, Yeti Espresso. Their prices are competitive. You can find them at yetibars.net or at their Yeti Bars Facebook page. Go check them out at both places. You can order from both places. And if you use the discount code DC10 at checkout, you get a 10% discount. Go check them out. These guys are doing a great job and they're great guys. Just a great family, family owned business making great soaps. I'm so happy I'm involved with them. Yetibars.net. Yeti Bars on Facebook. Go check them out. This one comes from a lady named Neoma Finn in the category... Oh, wait a minute. That's me. Since I've joined with Cam in his venture to share Bigfoot encounters with the world, I thought it'd be nice to share with all of you my own encounter. I think it's a fair statement to say that most people don't develop an interest in Bigfoot or any other cryptid, unless they have, or someone else close to them has, had their own encounter. The operative word there is most. Some of us have always had an interest in them, even without an encounter. I'm one of those. 
My first inclination that one of those bumps of the night might have a big footprint and some pretty nasty body odor came in the form of the movie The Legend of Boggy Creek. It was released in August of 1972 and took place in the state from which most of my family hailed. Since I distinctly remember watching it on TV, I'm going to guess I didn't see it until a year or more after its release. So I would have been around eight or nine. Regardless, it was far and away the most frightening movie I had ever watched, and I watched it on a double billing with The Night of the Living Dead. What can I say? Zombies just don't do it for me. My imagination was next sparked by the made-for-TV documentaries Monsters, Mysteries, or Myths, narrated by Rod Serling, and The Mysterious Monsters, narrated by Peter Graves. After seeing those documentaries and a few others like them, I was hooked on the subject. Little did I know the day would come when I would move from believing to knowing. In 1984, my then-husband and I lived in a cabin on the Mississippi River. Get out your maps and find I-280. It crosses the river in Rock Island, Illinois. The river runs a general east to west there, so the bridge crosses it from southeast to northwest. On the northeast side of that bridge, so close to it that the bridge shaded it from the afternoon sun, sat the cabin. Like all the cabins down there, it sat up on stilts. Unlike the other cabins, ours had a lattice skirt around it. The side of the cabin facing the river had a long, wide porch that ran the entire length of that side. The inside consisted of a living area that wrapped in a J-shape around a massive fireplace to the kitchen and eating area. Together, they formed the interior walls of the only bedroom. To the far north side of the cabin was the bathroom. We had electricity and indoor plumbing, but that was about it. We heated the place with a fireplace insert that sat in the giant fireplace. We didn't use the one bedroom for anything other than storage because it was too cold. Our bed was an old hide-a-bed sofa with the legs missing. It sat up on cinder blocks because the bed frame needed the extra space beneath for storage. When we unfolded it, we had additional cinder blocks to put the feet of the bed on. That sofa weighed a ton. It's important that you know that fact. And it sat on the same wall that was adjacent to the bridge. As you might guess, we were so poor we couldn't pay attention. Neither I nor my husband was working at the time. Our only income came from the trot lines he ran on a commercial fishing license and the hides he hunted during the winter. I was pregnant with my second child and we didn't have a phone, so my best friend would come and stay with me at night while my husband went coon hunting in the woods and wetlands that surrounded the cabin. It was a lot less built up back then. Each night, my friend and I would sit on a blanket in front of the fireplace and play gin rummy while my two-year-old slept beside us on a pillow. It was actually really cozy. We also felt pretty safe because I had a forty-four caliber black powder Smith & Wesson for protection. It was also my signal to my husband if something went wrong. All I had to do was step out onto the porch, fire three rounds into the air, and he'd come running. On the night of the first incident, we were in the middle of our gin rummy marathons when something slapped the side of the house so hard it knocked that big old hide-a-bed sofa off its cinder blocks forward onto its front. It startled us both so badly we jumped up and ran to the front window to see what could have done it. There were no side windows or any back windows on that house. My first thought was that a car had driven off the bridge and crashed into us. Logic eventually took over and I came to my senses on that thought, but something had definitely hit the cabin and I needed to know what. I grabbed the pistol and a flashlight and headed out onto the long porch. I don't remember there being a moon that night, but with the bridge and all the trees around us, it wasn't going to be very bright anyway. I ran to the side of the house that had been hit and shined the flashlight. Nothing. My best friend ran to the other side and I followed close behind. There was nothing there either. I don't remember now if we smelled anything or if we heard something. It's been too many years ago. I just remember being more and more afraid 
as I realized that whatever hit the side of our cabin hard enough to knock something as heavy as that old sofa on its face left no evidence behind. As a last resort, I fired three rounds into the air and waited for my husband to come back. He wasn't happy. We told him what had happened, and he didn't believe us. Even after he walked around the cabin and discovered missing Lattice in the exact spot where the house would have been hit, he refused to believe our story. It was late November or early December. In that part of the country, the ground is generally frozen by then, so there was no discernible footprint. However, me being me, I was convinced it had been a Bigfoot. This drew more anger and derision from my husband. When I tried to tell the story to friends, he would immediately tell me to shut up, that people would think I was crazy or stupid, and he was right. Those few people who listened long enough to hear the whole story just thought I was crazy or stupid. I would have preferred crazy. Another month went by, and an ice jam on the river drove us out of the cabin. We lost everything in that flood. My husband had to put me and my son in a boat and push us out through the ice and hip waders. Frankly, I was glad to be away from the place. My younger son was born in March and life went on. It was sometime in late July or maybe early August when we decided to go fishing. My husband wanted to fish some ponds down in the woods that were on the opposite side of the bridge from where the cabin had been. I was okay with it but wondered how we were going to pack in everything necessary for a now three-year-old child and a baby. Foolish me. He planned to leave us where he'd parked the car, fishing in a backwater pond where we'd catch nothing but dogfish. I was not happy. The spot was a little clearing just a hundred or so yards down the road from the cabin and across the way. It was a teardrop-shaped clearing with a narrow driveway at the point and the side running along the edge of the pond I was expected to fish. We set up a playpen for the baby and covered it in mosquito netting. My three-year-old and I made hot dogs and roasted marshmallows in the small fire I'd built to help keep the mosquitoes at bay, and my husband had left his Coleman lantern for us. Eventually, my three-year-old got tired and I put him in the playpen next to his brother to sleep. By now, it was completely dark out, but the sky was clear. Stargazing is one of my favorite pastimes. Even though there was far too much light pollution from the surrounding cities, I was definitely enjoying what I could see. There was no point in watching my line anyway. Nothing was going to bite that I wanted to keep. So I was sitting there in my lawn chair, my boys behind me and to the right in the playpen, our car behind me and to the left facing towards the entrance to the little clearing, and I was facing the pond and looking up at the stars when I heard a rustling in the bushes. My first thought was that it was a raccoon back there digging at something or going through some trash someone had dumped there. As the rustling grew louder, though, it got more and more difficult to blame on a raccoon. This was something definitely shaking the trees, and I was pretty sure trying to scare me. It had to be my husband, I thought. He's getting even with me for last winter when I was convinced our house had been attacked by a Bigfoot. Then I heard a sound I couldn't identify. I admit that I don't readily recognize the sounds of some animals. I don't have a problem with most of them because I've heard them often enough. But there are a few that I might not automatically know. One is the fox. I have just never been where the population has been strong enough to hear them often enough to be comfortable identifying them. So, when I couldn't immediately put a name to what I was hearing at that moment, I told myself it must be a fox on steroids. Or maybe an owl. Or maybe a fox pretending to be an owl. Or maybe an owl pretending to be a coyote. Or maybe a talking coyote. With each new thought, I was becoming more and more uncomfortable. Between the shaking of the trees, the chattering sound, and an odor that smelled so bad it burned my nose, discomfort was quickly turning to panic. I was weighing my options when I heard the sound move from directly behind me to the direction of the opening of the clearing. I looked over and saw the impossible. A man, well, maybe not a man, but something shaped like a man, who was at least eight feet tall, and I'd be happier saying ten feet, 
stepped across the driveway in one step. The following year, when my husband forced me to go back down there and confront my fear, I stood on the spot where I'd seen this thing cross, and I walked across that driveway. It took me five steps. This thing did it in one. A moment later, as I sat frozen in fear, flight mode hadn't kicked in yet, I heard it wade down into the water. The pond was not deep. It might have been maybe four feet at its deepest point. So hearing something wade through the water rather than swim it was probably not a big deal. That this thing sounded bipedal to me was. I should have shined my flashlight across the water to get a good look at it. I was too afraid. I didn't want to see it. I just sat there. At some point, it stopped and splashed around. I don't know if it was bathing in that nasty water, playing in it, or grabbing fish out of it. I just know it splashed around for a bit, then waded up on the opposite side. I didn't hear it again. I couldn't pack my children up fast enough. I put them both in the car, threw the playpen in the trunk, along with my lawn chair, my fishing pole and tackle box, and the little cooler I'd brought with the food and drinks, and then I got in the car with them. I didn't grab the lantern because I didn't want the light to go out, which it, it did eventually. I didn't put out the fire because I needed it for security, and it eventually went out too. And I honked the horn and sat there waiting for my husband. I noticed he'd taken the keys with him, and I was definitely cussing him for that. But it's probably a good thing. He didn't come back when I honked. I honked every half hour until daylight, and he never came back until the sun came up. If I'd have had the keys, he'd have come back to an empty clearing, and he'd have walked home for all I cared. Naturally, I now had the visual proof I needed to tell people that it was, in fact, a Bigfoot that had hit the cabin the winter before. I knew this because I had now seen one. Not only that, but I'd heard one and I'd smelled one. I honestly thought that would be good enough for the people I knew. I was wrong. No one believed me. Everyone made fun of me. I didn't get to go fishing for a while. I didn't get to go camping for a while. I didn't get to do a lot of things for quite a while because I was the idiot who thought she saw a Bigfoot. Eventually, I just quit telling the story to adults. To entertain the kids around the campfire at night, I'd often share it with them. But kids are different from adults. Their faith in you is unshakable. That's why you have to be careful not to tell them a lie. The problem is, to tell them the story and make it interesting, I tended to embellish. Now, some 35 years later, I struggle to separate the true events of those two nights from embellishments. I call it having more chili than dog on the bun. I did my best to stick with the basic bones of the story here. Something slapped the side of the cabin and knocked the lattice off the house. Roughly seven months later, something else stepped across the clearing in front of me that appeared to be ten feet tall. It played in the water and went on its way. It wasn't easy to do this, by the way, but those are the basics. There are a couple of things I would like to get straight, though. At the time, I had never heard of a Bigfoot slapping a house. These two events drove me from being interested in Bigfoot to being passionate about it, so I have read a lot of encounters over the years. Yet until 2014, when I heard it on a podcast, I never heard another person mention having their house slapped. On that day, when that young man talked about it, it was a feeling of absolute vindication. Of course, since then, I've heard many people talk about it. I also want to point out that the entire time I was hearing and smelling the Bigfoot behind me, both of my children were in a playpen, also behind me with nothing but mosquito netting to protect them from the world. I've heard many stories of Bigfoot stealing children. At any moment, that thing could have snuck up and taken one or both of my children out of that playpen, and I wouldn't have known until it was too late. In another podcast that I heard in either 2014 or 2015, a young man shared his story of how he'd been stalked by a Bigfoot in the wintertime while performing his paper route. 
I was shocked to learn that the event took place only a couple of years after mine and directly across the river in the town of Eldridge, Iowa. Finally, if someone tells you they've seen something, doubt them if you will, but don't make fun of them. Even if you don't believe it, they do. And you may not be carrying the post-traumatic stress from it, but they are. Well, that's my story. It's why I listen to so many podcasts and YouTube channels about Bigfoot, and it's how I found Dixie Cryptid. Thank you for listening. Here's an email from Mike, and he titles this story, The Bigfoot That Wasn't. I've actually done a story before with this exact same title. So I wasn't going to use this, but I thought, well, he titled it. I'm going to use it. But this isn't the same one that I did uh, two, three months ago. This is a different one. It's really interesting. So you guys listen up. I've been interested in Bigfoot for a long time, but it wasn't until the last few years that I had the free time to be able to travel and see some good locations myself. I'm from the Midwest. We can't match Oregon, Washington, or Ohio, but there are a few spots that are known to have activity. One such place was in the state forest about four hours from me. And so late in September, I decided to spend a few days checking it out. On arriving, I set up in the main campground. This is a relatively isolated area and mostly draws trout fishermen to fish the local streams. There were a couple of fishermen camping with RVs, but otherwise I had the place to myself. At mid-afternoon, I set out driving some of the forest roads in my truck, just getting the feel of the area. When I came to a parking spot for a couple of mile long hiking trail, I decided to get out and stretch my legs and check out the walk-in campground that was supposed to be back in there. It was cool in the woods and I walked along quietly, just watching for animals and enjoying being out, not really expecting anything. But as I got close to the campground, off in the woods a few hundred yards to the south, there was a loud wood knock. I couldn't believe it. I actually heard a wood knock. And on my first hike, it was very loud and clear. I would describe it as ringing, almost. It sounded like hard, hard, dead wood, no bark, very clear. I stopped dead in my tracks and listened for a good 15 minutes, but there was nothing more. I didn't have my little baseball bat along, and I wasn't about to start screaming like I was on TV. So after a while, I just continued into the campground and looked around a little. I waited a while more. Still, there was nothing. And then I got to thinking again. I actually heard a wood knock. It's impossible to describe how exciting it was to actually hear one for myself. I knew I had to come back that night. At dusk, I came walking down the trail again. This time, I had my little baseball bat and, of course, some flashlights. It was a lot spookier this time, but I got all the way to the campground without hearing anything, and I sat down on a bench and I listened for a while. It was all very quiet. Finally, I got up off the bench and went to a nearby tree and gave it a good whack. It kind of echoed for a second. I dropped the bat and cut my hands around my ears to listen. After about 15 to 20 seconds, there was a quiet, single, I'm not sure how to describe it, a soft crunch, like a single, careful footstep on a soft, rotten log. Just that one soft, deliberate sound, like something saying quietly, hey, you don't have to shout, I'm right over here. The hairs on my neck stood up, wasn't very far away at all. I waited a few minutes and made another knock, more quietly this time, but there was no response. After listening a while more, I headed back to my truck. I'm sure you'll understand that I spent a lot of time shining my flashlight around into the woods and back behind me on the way out. This was all that happened on that first visit, but it was enough to get me fired up to come back again the next spring. It was just amazing to go to a place reputed to have activity and then actually experience it myself. I have no proof of what might have made the wood knock, but I will say I did not see any other people in this back area for the entire three days that I was there. And my thinking was, when did a human ever make just one single knock? 
So the next June, I was raring to go. I packed up my camping gear and headed back, hoping that I would have some more excitement. But little did I know what was coming. This time, I drove right to the trail parking lot. It was only late morning, and I figured I'd go set up camp after walking the trail once first. I tried to drive quietly the last half a mile and made as little noise as I could shutting the door when I got out. Hopefully I could surprise something and maybe hear another wood knock. I set out and before I was even a hundred yards down the trail, there was a huge loud crack. It was a sound to my left up on the ridge. I almost jumped out of my skin. It was so loud. It sounded like a whole tree being snapped like a pencil. My hair stood up and my stomach jumped up into my throat. I felt like I needed to be running like right now. And there, up on the ridge, I caught just a glimpse of something, something behind the bushes. I could see the sun glinting off the shiny black fur through the holes between the leaves, and it was moving off into heavier cover. I only saw it for a second. No identifiable shape, but roughly three to four feet high and a little less in width. It took me a couple of minutes to calm down, but wow, did I just get bluff charged? I heard nothing before or after the tree crack. There were no sticks falling, no thuds or other noises. But what had I seen? I was absolutely elated. Whatever that was, it wasn't a human and it wasn't a deer. And that is the only bigger animal that should be around. The DNR information online was clear. There were no bears in this whole corner of the state. And if it wasn't a bear, black shiny fur? You know, if I had to say from my gut what I saw, any animal in the world, I would say from its color, size, and the way it moved that it was something like a big chimpanzee. And talk about classic Bigfoot behavior, breaking a tree and warning me and slinking off into the heavy brush. After I recovered, I continued down the trail. When I got to the campground, I was surprised to see a man and his young son setting up camp. I walked over to talk, and I found out they had parked at the other end of the trail and walked in, and they arrived about a half an hour before me. They hadn't seen anything strange on their way here. Let me give you the lay of the land here, because it's relevant. There's this long trail with parking at both ends and a campground in the middle. To the south... Where last year's wood knot came from is nothing, no trails, no anything. And to the north from the campground, there's a draw or a ravine that runs up the ridge and twists to the west. So the head of that ravine is up in the woods there behind the ridge top on the west and the end I came in from. I'm thinking, what if the man and his son came walking down the trail and there's a young Bigfoot near the campground who sees them coming? So not to be seen himself, he has to run into the woods to the north, even though where he really wants to go is to the south, where there are thick woods and where my wood knot came from. So he works his way up the draw to get away from the campground and then turns south, intending to cross over the top of the ridge and come down the hill across the trail and then make his way into the woods to the south. Only when he is coming down from the ridge top, dang, there's another human in the way. So he's ticked off and instinctively cracks the tree at me and slinks back into cover. It made a lot of sense, I thought, and that's all that happened on that trip. But let me tell you, that was enough. I have never been so startled or scared as I was when that loud noise made me think I was about to be attacked or squashed by something. My next visit was great, too. I tried some gifting and had interesting results, but it's not directly relevant to the story, so I'll pass over that one. Last spring, I again returned, ready to try a few new things. But I did have a new piece of information I had found online. The DNR now said a few isolated black bears had been seen in this quarter of the state, presumably just passing through. I went to have a talk with the local ranger. 
After telling my story, we narrowed down the exact time I had been there, and he said that that month, the month when I experienced the tree cracking incident, a couple other hiking parties had reported seeing a black bear right along that specific trail. Furthermore, the very next month, Mr. Bear wandered out into the highway and got himself killed by a car. He had then been stuffed and was on display at the county museum. I could even go see him. A little more research taught me that bears do occasionally crack trees while engaging in scent-related behavior, although my experience was not typical at all. And when I visited Mr. Bear, he proved to be a little on the small side, which would be about right, but he was more of a cinnamon brown, not really a shiny black unless they both looked the same glinting in the bright sun. Apparently, my Bigfoot was the Bigfoot that wasn't. Although, to be fair, yes, what I saw was probably a bear, but where no bears were supposed to be, doing something bears don't really do in exactly that way and possibly changing color a bit in the process. There are starting to be an awful lot of coincidences there, so I may never know for sure. Thanks again for your stories, Cam, and I hope you liked this one. I did like that one, Mike. This is great. It's a great story, and... I, I would be wondering, you know, if, if I heard all those noises on different occasions, wood knocks, tree cracks, then I saw something black moving in the woods, I would immediately think, I think I would, I th especially if it was really big, that maybe it was a Bigfoot. I don't know, but uh, it makes perfect sense to me. Great story, Mike. Thanks for sending it, buddy. About two months ago, I got to know the author Tom Lyons. Tom Lyons is an author. He's written several, several books about cryptids. They're all true accounts. And he's a top-selling author. He sells a lot of books. And he and I collaborated on a project to do a, a series of audio books on the Beasts of Bray Road. And they're available now on Audible and iTunes. You guys go over to Audible, check it out. I think it's about a total of four hours worth of narration. It's all for sale on Audible. I'll put a link in the description below. Go check out some of my, my audiobooks. And be, hey, be gentle with me in the reviews. My first shot at narrating an audiobook. But I had so much fun doing it. Thank you, Tom, for offering to collaborate with me on that. And I hope you sell a ton of books off of it. But go check it out at Audible. It's the Beasts of Bray Road series. There's three volumes, book one, book two, and book three. And they're awesome. They're great little stories. They're short, one and a half hour audios, but they're really good. So I hope you guys can go check that out. Thank you. What follows is a conversation I had with someone I met in a parking lot of all places. It's highly unbelievable, but if the story is true, it raises some intriguing questions. Specifically, we already know their masters are blending into their environment. But what if they can blend into our environment, too? For instance, what would they do for a living, and how would they interact with neighbors? The Munsters and Adams Family TV shows come to mind. One afternoon, while grocery shopping in the city, I exited the store and made my way to my vehicle. While loading the groceries into the trunk, an approaching truck caught my attention. It looked like someone's work truck with their logo on the door. As fate would have it, they pulled up next to me. The driver saw me looking at his business name and logo on the door. After he and his wife got out, I asked him about it. I won't give the exact name here, Cam, but it did have the name Bigfoot in it. Specifically, I asked him why he named his business what he did. He looked over at his wife and said they just had a child and the baby had pretty big feet for being a newborn. I looked at him and paused. Oh, okay. I thought maybe it had something to do with Sasquatch. Then he looked back at me and paused. Really? Do you believe in Bigfoot? Yes, I do. I've interacted with them in five different states over the years. What do they look like, he asked. Well, I've seen a couple different types, you might say. The first type is the typical big, hairy creature, and the second is, well, very human-like. They don't have much hair at all and look more like us than the first type, but they're still large like the hairy ones and have feet larger than ours. 
I think this caught him off guard as he looked away from me and over at his truck for about ten seconds before looking back at me. You mean some of them can look like us? Yeah, I said. He stared into the distance for a moment. Then I asked, have you seen one before? Looking back at me, he appeared to be debating whether or not to answer truthfully. Well, I used to work for this man that was really big. I mean really big, and he had more body hair than normal, he said. How big was he, I asked. Almost eight feet tall, and he had a massive muscular body. Then he continued, Curious, I asked him once where he was from, and he told me Alamosa, Colorado. That's interesting, I replied. Interesting? Why? Well, those mountains outside of Alamosa have a long history of Bigfoot sightings. Maybe that was his way of saying where he was from without meaning the city of Alamosa. You know, Alamosa is the biggest town in that area. People may know of it, and that would be enough. He looked at me for a moment before continuing. You know, I also asked him about his shoes and clothes. Like, where he got them, as they were bigger than anything I'd ever seen. He told me they're custom made for him and his family. After pausing again, he added, He shaved a lot, too, like his whole body. He told me that once, too. You know, he continued after collecting his thoughts, I once dropped a large tree off at his place and before leaving said I'd help him move it with my tractor. He told me not to worry about it, that he'd take care of it. I didn't understand. He didn't have a tractor and I was there with mine. It would only take a couple of minutes, so I insisted and started to climb down from my truck. He just looked at me and walked over to the log and wrapped his arms around the end of it and lifted it up to his waist. What? I said. Yeah, the guy told me. I still can't figure that one out. It weighed about five tons. He just lifted it up and moved it with ease. Smiling, I looked at my new friend and asked, So did you really name your business after your son's big feet? No, he laughed. This is where the conversation ended. I realized many people believe Sasquatch is a beast, monster, and apex predator, nothing more. However, there exist many accounts which suggest this creature is intelligent, compassionate, protective of their own as well as humans, and in many ways human-like. Besides being humanoid, they have mates, rear children, grow old, and die like us. Some accounts suggest they have different roles within their clan or tribe. They have also engaged in gift-giving and other forms of curiosity and communication with humans. They may even have a sense of humor. Finally, witnesses report they look very human, and some hunters couldn't shoot it because it looked like a hairy person. Some Bigfoot have a face like a gorilla, some like a Neanderthal, and some are very human like ours. Finally, there are accounts of people talking with them verbally as well as telepathically. Some have even received handwritten notes in English and drawings from the Bigfoot. So what if Bigfoot come in several types, sizes, shapes, colors, etc.? Take dinosaurs, for example. Dinosaurs come in a variety of species, types, sizes, shapes, colors, and diets, but all are still referred to as dinosaurs. In the case of Bigfoot, might the same be true? It could account for all the varied descriptions and behaviors. With all of this in mind, I'd like to pose a question. If someone claims to have spent time living with or among Bigfoot, and if true, is it possible for Bigfoot to assimilate into our communities and way of life? Admittedly, reports of people being kidnapped by Bigfoot or going with them willingly are rare, yet accounts do exist. Could the opposite be possible? What if this man's story is true? Here's an email from someone who wants to be anonymous, and here's what he writes. It's an Ohio story. It has a little bit of a woo theme to it at the end. Just hang on and wait. You're, you're going to like this. He says, I live in central Ohio, and I'd rather, I'd rather remain anonymous. No problem. 
I go out hiking in the woods looking for Sasquatch and the art they make in the form of structures and arches. Earlier this year, I started exploring a forest where, just driving through it, I found all kinds of signs on both sides of the road. I've hiked this area for maybe three or four months now, and everywhere I've been so far has had evidence of structure breaks, arches, uprooted trees, busted trees, and tracks. I always whistle a couple of times because I'm just hiking in, just to let them know that I'm here. There's no doubt that they have been in this forest for years. The area is ideal for them with its sandstone cliffs and small streams. I found my first prints here along one of those streams. It runs up a small valley with steep cliffs on both sides. After hiking for a while and following the stream, I found a spot that was dammed up with rocks. There was a small sapling that had been pulled out of the ground by its roots and debarked. It was shoved upside down with the roots in the air in the middle of the small dam. This is also where I found my first prints in the mud. I wanted to take the sapling as a souvenir of the day, but I didn't because, to be honest, I was kind of scared to. Two weeks later, my wife and I came back on a rainy day, and as always, I whistled a couple of times on our way in. I also used this as a way to build trust with them. Usually, after I whistle, I hear tapping from different parts of the woods. This isn't always the case, but it was generally so, but not today. Everything was just wet and silent. We came up on some arched trees, but there was too much brush to walk through to get to them, so I zoomed my camera lens in and I took some shots. Then I tossed a rock towards the arches and I hiked on for a while before leaving. That night at home, I kept thinking about that sapling. It had still been there, and I just kept thinking that I wanted something of theirs, and that sapling was pretty cool to look at. The next morning, I decided to go get it. I hiked in as far as the dam in the stream. I took a quick look around for more prints and thought, okay, I'm taking this sapling. So I did. I was pretty nervous on the way out. I didn't feel right about what I had done. I got back to my car and found a small tree branch on my windshield between the wiper blades. I was parked under some trees, so it could have just fallen there, but the way it was positioned just seemed too deliberate. It would have been a one in a million shot in nature. My wife was with me, and we both had to use the bathroom. We drove a mile up the road to a small public restroom. The whole time, I couldn't get rid of the feeling that I shouldn't have taken that sapling. The restroom was a small building with a metal roof and a concrete block wall separated the men's side from the women's. We were only in there for about three or four minutes. I could hear the rain pinging on the tin roof, but then a rock hit the side of the building. When we came out, I asked my wife if she heard anything. She hadn't. Furthermore, the sun had come out and there was no rock on the ground. Now I was getting scared. I told her that we were going back right then to return that sapling. We got halfway back to where we would have to park the car, and I got a really good feeling about taking the sapling. I suddenly knew that it would be okay to take it home with me. Later that evening, I was thinking over the events of the day, and I came to the conclusion that the bathroom experience was them letting me know that they knew I was in the woods that day. Now, I am certain that they have supernatural abilities. Thanks for reading my story. Well, that's, uh, that's interesting. I don't, maybe they do have supernatural abilities or telepathic where they can kind of put you at ease or make you afraid. I don't know. I hear a lot of that. There's a lot of evidence of that in these stories. But this is real interesting. And uh, I wonder if you still have the sapling. I mean, you have it like framed or sticking in or laying around your house somewhere. That would be interesting. But yeah, if I saw a tree uprooted and stuck in the in the mud or in in middle of a pond or something like that, and I could carry it, I might pick it up and bring it home. I wouldn't be opposed to that, and I wouldn't feel like I was stealing anything because it's just a it's a tree. Come on. All right. Thank you for the story. I thought it was great. Really well written, and we all enjoyed it. Thank you, sir. 
Here's an email from Mike, and this is real interesting. He says, I'm sharing this with you because I recently came across your channel on YouTube. I've noticed several similarities to what you read about and what happened to me eight years ago. I want to start off by saying, I don't know what I saw. I can't say it was or was not a Bigfoot, nor will I say I don't believe anymore. I grew up in Swiss, Missouri. At the beginning of the email, he gives me a little bit of a description of Swiss, Missouri, and it sounds like a really great place in the, in the Ozarks in Missouri. It's really nice wine country, I think. Sounds very appealing to me. He writes, while growing up, I hunted and fished all over the area. I even swam in most of the creeks. My family roots date back to the turn of the century here in Swiss. My great-great-grandfather's farm was a whopping five miles east of where I live today. Through the years growing up there, nothing ever happened that I would consider odd or out of place. As the years passed, I hit adulthood and moved away thinking there was something better out there. Then in 2011, I moved back knowing where I wanted to plant my roots. I ended up buying acreage connecting to our family farm and I built a home and a barn. I had approximately 20 chickens and 5 guineas at this time. Unfortunately, ticks are rough out this way and both chickens and guineas enjoy eating them. So I felt this was a decent investment, plus the eggs were good. It was in the early spring, April 5th to be exact, a cool evening, windows open, and my fiancé and I were sitting on the couch watching a show on TV when I heard a fuss outside. My dog started barking and raising cane, so I muted the TV and got off the couch. Walking into the dining room, I heard what I believed were coyotes trying to get at my chickens. I walked back into the living room and into my bedroom to grab my gun. As I walked back into the dining room, I heard my dog really let loose because he was extremely protective of his chickens. I flipped on the back porch lights. I walked out onto the deck, which sits approximately six to seven feet off the ground, and I could see something in the shadows, and my old dog had his hair standing straight up and barking and growling like he'd gone mad. I fired several rounds into the woods that backed into the natural-fed Spring Creek. I heard what sounded like a freight train crashing through the woods. After a few minutes, I called my dog back up to the house and we went in. I told my fiancé that what had happened and she said maybe a cow had gotten out or something. I thought for a minute and I said, yeah, I guess that's what it could have been. Three days later, on Friday evening, my fiancé and I went into Herman for dinner and to visit some friends. We got home late sometime just before midnight. We were pretty wore out, but I always checked the barn and the chickens when I got home. As I walked to the chicken coop, I noticed a feeder laying on the ground. I picked it up, and thinking my dog had somehow got a hold of it and drug it out in the yard, as I approached the chicken coop, I noticed a hole in the chicken wire approximately six feet up, and the hole was about 18 to 20 inches around. I opened the coop, and I noticed blood and feathers were everywhere, but only a couple of chickens were gone. I figured somehow a coyote or a fox had to get into the coop, but I couldn't comprehend why or who had made this hole that size and that high up off the ground. However, this is the price to raising any small animals out in the sticks. The chicken wire portion of my coop is only four feet wide and six feet long. I normally let the chickens out and run freely to eat ticks and peck the ground, so I didn't feel I needed a large run area in the coop. However, that night, I rounded them up and fed them and kept them locked in the coop due to the coyotes and foxes in the area. This is my attempt at making it as hard as possible for them to be dinner, and the predators will move on down the road. Later that same night, after patching the hole with some scrap chicken wire, I showered and got into bed, wore out and ready to sleep. I had just hit that spot where you're asleep, but still somewhat alert and extremely comfortable. When my old dog started his crazy barking and then I heard this howl, scream, growling noise I have never heard in my life coming from the backyard. 
I grew up almost 18 years in this area and just moved back after being gone for only five years. I hunt and I trap everything you can think of. I've heard a fox scream. I've heard a bobcat scream. I've heard mountain lions and black bear. I've heard deer grunts and turkeys gobble. But I have never, ever, ever heard this noise before. Now due to our closest neighbor being approximately a quarter mile away, and that was family I knew, no one would be on my property this late. So as I sat up trying to comprehend the noise and understand what I had heard, I grabbed for my 300 wind mag, fearing that this isn't an average everyday animal. And then I heard what I thought to be fencing being torn. My dog was already at the back door begging to be let out. He knew something wasn't right. I opened the door, stepping onto the deck after turning on the porch lights, and all I could see was something near the coop. My old dog took off full sprint towards it. Now, he's fought off countless coyotes and foxes, but tonight he wasn't ready for this thing. He got close, and I heard the screaming growl that I can't explain, and before I knew it, my dog flew into the side of my deck. This was a good 20 feet away from where this thing was. Well, now I was furious, thinking that it had killed my dog, and I leveled my rifle, and I shot everything I had in it, five rounds total, and again, I heard crashing like a freight train going down into the woods near the creek. I rushed down and grabbed my dog, scared to death that it was too late. He was about 70 pounds of pure muscle. I picked him up and got him inside. I put him on the table and I turned on the dining room light and I was horrified that he was gashed down his side like a razor blade had cut him. He was winding and in tremendous pain. He was having trouble breathing and he had lost a ton of blood. I know growing up on the farm that it's not right to allow an animal to suffer. It's not fair to the animal in my opinion to let it lay there and die. I knew what I needed to do even though it would kill me to do it. I took him back outside in the front yard and I told him that he was a good boy and how much I loved him and that it was time for me to put him out of his misery. I lost my best friend that night. I spent the next hour digging a hole with my fiance holding a flashlight and a gun just to make sure that that thing didn't come back. As I buried my dog, I felt anger at this animal for killing my dog. I felt fear because I wasn't sure what it was. And then I felt empty because there was nothing I could do. The next morning, I went out to see the damage. This thing completely destroyed the chicken wire, and the only thing that saved the remaining 11 chickens and all the guineas was the actual wood coop. However, it had damaged the roof on the coop, too. I believe what angered this thing when it let out that god-awful sound was the fact that it was unable to get in the coop and grab more chickens. I spent the next two days rebuilding the coop and following the trail this thing had made into the woods. I never saw any footprints or tracks, nor did I find blood or hair. But I will tell you that it's now 2019, almost exactly eight years later, and other than that curious fox or annoying coyote, I have had no issues. I have never heard that noise again, and I still live in that same home, now married to that same woman and we have a new dog who will be eight in July. I will never forget that day, and I'll never forget that sound that that thing made, and I'll never forget the fear that that thing brought. I'm not going to say for sure that this was a Bigfoot, nor will I say that it wasn't. I can tell you that I've been to several states hunting bear, boar, elk, and deer. I've spent more hours in the woods than your average joke. And I've never felt that fear. I've never seen or heard anything that can compare to that thing. And that's the end of the story. He goes on to uh, invite me to Swiss, Missouri. And then he's got a bottle of Herman's world famous Stonehill wine waiting for me if I ever get up there. And some good old elk jerky from the Swiss meat market. Well, thank you very much, Jake. That's a that's a great story. I don't know what in the world could have cut your dog like that. The when I read this, the first thing I thought was maybe it was a pig. You know, these wild pigs get out and they just have razor sharp teeth. And that's kind of how they wound animals with their tusks. And they just slice you with them. 
I don't know, man. What a scary story. I got this back in 2019. I'm just now getting to it. I've got a few left from 2019, but I, but I, I just finally found this one. I thought, man, this is a great story to, to share. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I know I did. I really appreciate the writer for sending it. Hope everything's going good up in Swiss, Missouri, buddy. Appreciate the story. I believe that's going to do it, y'all. Thank you for listening this far in the video or listening at all. If you're hearing this conclusion of a video, then you have listened this far. I really appreciate it. You're the best person in the world. We'll see you guys on the next video. Thank you.